friends. Glad that you're here tonight. Some of you, this may be your first time to be in an Ash Wednesday service and are like, I'm not sure what I've got myself into. Others of you, this is something you look to uh, every year, and it's very important to you. Uh, to help us all land on the same page, today is what's called Ash Wednesday. And it's the first of 40 days, not counting Sundays, that we have before Easter. And these, this day in particular is meant for us to think about our own sinfulness, our own mortality, and how dependent we are upon Jesus and His new life. It helps prepare us for the true celebration of what Easter is. So there, it's important to have a time where we reflect upon our daily rhythms and routines, about how God is part of that, or how we have pushed God out of those daily routines. This is a great night for us to repent and to remember the power of the gospel. So I'm going to invite you uh, to allow yourself to move with the Spirit. Um, it means so much to me that we come from so many different churches uh, and denominations tonight to be in one place to worship. I think that's a witness that our community needs more of. So whatever tradition you're familiar with, don't worry if you stand up and everybody else is sitting, or if you go to sit and everybody else wants to stand, it doesn't really matter. We're all here worshiping one God, and that's what matters most. So let's join in the attitude of prayer together. God, we come from work, we come from homes and from schools, we come from right down the road, we come from across town, but we all come hungry, hungry for you, Lord. We ask that on this night, that the inbreaking of your spirit would break our hearts of stone, and that we would truly seek repentance and forgiveness, and have our eyes on the prize of you. In the name of your son we pray, amen. On behalf of the Chancel Choir and myself, Fangie Gordon, the uh, choir director here at the church, uh, we want to welcome you to our service this evening. Uh, we like you to sing loud. So <laughs> we will be singing on page 269 in our red hymnal, or the words will be on the screens if you just prefer to watch, uh, watch them from there. If you'll please stand as you're able.
if you'd join me in our responsive reading. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. Now, Reverend Dennis Jones of Dublin Baptist Church is going to speak to us about our offering this evening. There was an instance in which Jesus caught the disciples doing something he didn't approve of. They were trying to keep children away from Jesus because children should be seen and not heard. Children aren't important, they're just little. Only adults matter. And to give you the Jones paraphrase, Jesus' reaction, what he said to the disciples is, what's the matter with you guys? Do you not know how important these people are in the kingdom of God? Children matter. If children matter to Jesus, then everyone that follows Jesus, they ought to matter to us too. Weekday religious education is an opportunity to demonstrate how important it is that children hear the word of God. I wish that all the children of Dublin were in one of the churches every Sunday, but they aren't. Many of them aren't. Some of them, the only opportunity they have to hear the word of God is through weekday religious education. When I came here nearly 12 years ago, I was shocked to find there was weekday religious education going on because I come from California and that would have been anathema there. And I was surprised that somebody hadn't tried to shut it down, but they haven't and I'm thankful every year that it continues. But it continues not only because there hasn't been opposition, but it continues because there's support. And your support is vital to help because there is cost to it. And all of the offerings that will be taken in all of the services in all of the churches during Lent, it's not going to go to the church that's hosting the service. It will go to support weekday religious education. Let me encourage you to agree not with the disciples, but to agree with Jesus and to show that by your giving. Children matter in the kingdom of God.
It could help weekday religious education. It can be passed on. Father, everything on the earth is yours. We are simply stewards of such a small part. Father, take what we give, use it, multiply it. May it bring children to your son. In his name we pray, amen.
Friends, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Reverend Dr. Karen Black. She's the pastor at Randolph Avenue United Methodist Church. And uh, Karen and I met a number of years ago. And uh, actually, we've seen each other recently out in St. Louis. Um, Karen is a great communicator, uh, just very wise theologically, and just a good person to be around. And I'm glad we're here tonight to hear her message. I invite Karen to come forward. interesting when you read your responsive reading, it was my text, Psalm 51. So I had to decide which verses I would read because I would not read 17 verses again. <laughs> so <coughs> I'm going to read the first and the second, first through the third verse, the 12th verse, and the 17th verse. Listen for the word of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And the 17th verse says, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Let us pray. Most gracious God, you are loving and you are kind. You are gracious and you have been good to us. And you have brought us to this point in this year where we begin our Lenten season with Ash Wednesday. You constantly remind us of our mortality and our need to search for you. It is in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Today, Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of a season of penance self-reflection, fasting, and prayer. Since the second century, and widely spread since the fifth century, Christians around the world have observed the weeks leading up to Easter as a solemn time. But let us reflect on the age of the selfie and get a picture of exactly what we're looking at and how Lent affects us. It is always fun to turn on the cell phone, tablet, and take a glimpse of our dearest relatives and favorite first Facebook friends grinning back at us, looking chic and ready for action. Sometimes we're on Facebook more than we are reading the Bible on the phone. But we look at all of these because we get a glimpse and a caption of what's going right, what's going wrong, and we have to go, hmm. So when we find a great way to connect uh, with our children and grandchildren and friends near and abroad, and we find out all kind of fascinating things and situations and circumstances, of course, they control what we see. And usually they are selective. Over the years, I've worn festive robes and garments because I like clothes. Because my father was a pastor. And he was concerned about what he considered to be appropriate dress for his family, especially on Sunday morning. 
So all that's ingrained in me. If you know me, you know I'm going to have a bunch of clothes. But I can assure you, I buy everything on sale and bargain. I will watch an item for a month until it is reduced. And then I will go and buy it because I know it's going to be on the shelf because nobody's going to pay that money for it. So <clears throat> when we wear, I wear these clothes at great festivals, other occasions, and solemn services. With proper attitude, ornate vestments, along with soaring Gotham churches and stained glass windows, can reflect a glorious, the glorious beauty of our almighty God. But I have to guard against the temptation to say, look at me in all my finery. The same thing goes for fine dinners. I find a couple of selfie subjects of particular interest as we enter the season of Lent, Ash Wednesday, and they are clergy and their costumes and gourmet dinners guaranteed to suck drool from the mouths of the most abstinious people who avoid doing fun things such as enjoying themselves by eating or drinking too much. Today, our text invites us to examine our motives as we fulfill such Christian duties as giving, praying, and fasting. It makes us look at how we're living. It makes us look at what we're doing. It makes us look at how are we connecting with God. It makes us look at how we treat one another. It makes us look at all of the things that we constantly see and hear on a daily basis that are at the opposite end of the continuum for our Lord and Savior. We take delight in living out these obligations because we long to glorify God, we say. If others notice us at all, we hope that we are encouraging them to do the same, and that is to glorify God and not always lifting us up and praising us because God gave us the ability to do something. And God notices us. God notices our attitudes as well as our actions. Some of us got bad attitudes. My attitude is bad sometimes too, so say my children. But my actions are not always right either, and I'm not always right. But I know that when God is looking at me and others, I have to have a spirit of penitence. I have to repent for what I'm doing. I have to make amends and try to walk in the path in which God has set out before me, and we all have to do the same thing. And deeds without benefits of our selfies, God sees who we are and through Jesus Christ still loves us, still pardons us, still absolves us, and restores us to God's selves, warts, dust, and all. It would be great as human beings if we could do the same. It kills some of us to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, forgive me, I shouldn't have done that. But God forgives us every day for all of the foolishness that we do, all of us. No one is exempt from it, not even me, because I have a piece of paper that says I'm a clergy. That does not make me the best saintly person in this world, because I'm always not that way, but my determination is to strive to do the will of God. And when we love, it drives us to do that which right. My job is to love you, not to judge you, not to condemn you. Because when I point one finger, three are pointing back at me. And so therefore, God looks at all the mess and still forgives us in spite of ourselves. Ash Wednesday focuses on the human predicament about the human person as a sinner. We are all sinners saved by grace, and I am so grateful for that. Sin is an experience 
It's experienced as a state of being, a condition of the total life. There is no way that we escape sin. Even though we're told, until we're told we're in sin, we don't know we're in sin. God does forgive ignorance, but when we know better, God holds us responsible. As I used to say to my children, I'm going to tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. Because when I get before God, my hands will be clean because I did what I was supposed to do. Now, I don't care if you like it or not, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You'll know somebody in this life going to tell you the truth, whether you hear it, want to hear it or not. And so sin is a willful action that ultimately means the human is wrong and has committed a sin against God. And when we don't recognize that and opens up our hearts, we muddy the water. Sin contaminates. Sin stains. Sin pollutes and renders unclean. Now, you know the Jewish community was concerned about being unclean, especially the priests. They weren't going to touch a Dutch person. They weren't, near, uh, they weren't going to get any, near any blood. They weren't going to get a, uh, near anything that had bodily fluids because they knew what we didn't know, that the disease was carried in the fluids. So they stayed away from it so they could stay pure to do the sacrifices and they could stay pure to do the ceremonies that they needed to do either in the temple or in the synagogues as time went on. They wanted to stay clean. Hmm, that's a desire that sometimes we don't think about, staying clean ourselves. The idea of sin as a pollutant that permeates the whole person means that there is no such thing as an isolated event or action. A sinful act discolors, disrupts, and skews the entire personality like a fading cloth in the family's wash. We get those washcloths and we have washed so much, or we get a towel and somebody has some acne cream on it, I don't care, I'm going to wash your face off. All of a sudden you see splotches and stuff fading out all over your, your towels. And that's what happens with us and our personality when sin begins to stain us and disrupt things. Over against sin, one profess, presents confessionally and gives expressions to components involved in the forgiveness and the renewal of life. We want to forgive, be forgiven, and have a renewal of our life. The first is the worshiper requests God to change them. The psalmist, the psalmist seeks divine approval. The second, the psalmist pleads for new and renewed experiences of joy, gladness, and rejoicing. The psalmist asked to be changed by divine actions. Teach me, purge me, wash me. When a real change comes, it comes from the divine almighty. We pray for some of our friends and family members for years, but until they open up their heart to receive God, the change does not come. But when it does, you see a transformation, and many times we don't want to listen and believe that there's change. But those persons, like I used to hear older people say, the things I used to do, I don't want to do no more. Because change has occurred within that person. The psalmist also seeks approval. Finally, the psalmist is requesting intimacy with the divine. Intimacy comes through prayer and having a talk with God. But waiting for God to answer and not think that God is a genie in a box or a jack in a box and going to pop up and give us the answer at a split second. God does not do it that way. We have to work, think about it, wait, and figure out how God is talking to each one of us. Because God talks to all of us in a different manner. And so the psalmist offers vows and makes a, of, of, a vow that and a testimony that he's going to instruct those who are making transgressions and lead sinners back to God. This goes along with where we start out instructing our young people and our children. We begin to instruct them, and we say if we instruct them now, when they get older, they're going to do some stuff that they want to do because we did some stuff that we want to do, and it wasn't the right stuff to do, but we still did it. 
but they will come back to God because the foundation has been laid. When we see when there are earthquakes and houses are knocked down by tornadoes, if you look around, the foundation is still there. The rest of the house is torn up, but that foundation is still there, so the psalmist is making this vow. And then the psalmist on Ash Wednesday, since Ash Wednesday is about penitence, being contrite, and asking for forgiveness, but it's also about remembering we are mortal. None of us are going to last forever. One day they're going to roll us in a box in front of somebody with an empty body, nothing but an empty shell. And we will have made the transition to heaven or to hell, depending on the life that we live. But on Ash Wednesday, we receive ashes on our forehead and hear these words, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now this comes from Genesis 3 and 19. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. In the beginning, God brought life out of dust. God breathed his own breath into a lump of ashes, and they came alive. God made us out of dust and stamped us with the divine image. That image and that divine connection that we all are seeking and through our actions of asking for forgiveness and our penitence, God, we find God, and God brings us back to that divine image. God does some amazing things with dust and ashes. The final reminder on this Wednesday is, as the purest form of sacrifice, the worshiper offers to God a broken, contrite heart and spirit. Amen. Join me in the call for confession. It shows on the screens. Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to be truly human. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill considered word, Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come, fill us this moment, and free us from sin. Hear these words of hope. Today, as the people of God, we cross a threshold. And this day marks a new beginning. We step intentionally into that which is broken and torn. A space in which we learn to be vulnerable again, so that we may journey into the very heart of God. We slow our pace during these 40 days, because the landscape of Lent takes us through the wilderness of our own hearts and souls. We must walk carefully. We must think deeply. We must allow our hearts to be broken open. We must be willing to lay bare all that is hidden 
buried and repressed. We are pilgrims in this land, looking to God for guidance in the unfamiliar terrain. This is a journey that every Christian must take. We start in ashes and in an end in a garden, teeming with new life and impossible possibility. I appreciate Reverend Dr. Karen Black's message. We all would do well if we would repent and believe the gospel. If we would just repent and remember from ashes we've come, to ashes we'll return. You are now, I have an opportunity in a few moments to come forward and to receive what's called the imposition of the ashes. What this means is that ashes that have come from palms used on Palm Sunday are now mixed with olive oil and this will be used as um, a sign on your forehead or your wrist whichever one you present when you come forward why do we use ashes from palm leaves from a palm sunday and it's to remind us as you know the story that jesus rode into root into jerusalem and the palm leaves came up and everybody was like how powerful and wonderful jesus is give him praise he is our god but in less than a week's time, they were yelling, crucify him. And how often we can do that, not just in a week, but in a day and moment to moment. So these ashes are a reminder to us that we need to repent and believe the gospel. I want to invite those helping uh, give the imposition of ashes to come forward. And there'll be a station here and here standing. And there'll be stations behind the altar rails as well. When you come forward, we invite you, uh, you'll be asked if you would like to be prayed for, if there's something you want to ask specific prayer for, and you may not have anything to pray for, and that's fine, um, but just either present your wrist, or uh, you know, if you want to move your, your hair to the side, or, and we'll make the sign of a cross on either one of those places, or if you just want prayer, you may go back to your seat. Um, that's fine as well. We invite you to come by the center aisle, and then return by the side aisles. I invite those helping serve to come for it this time. We invite you to come forward.
invite Reverend Phil Madison to come forward from Highland Community Church, and he'll be giving us our benediction. Would you stand, please? As we stand to our feet, we bow in our hearts to an almighty God who is willing and able to hear our cry. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you have created us individually. You have created us in community. You have created us for eternity to be with you. And Father, as we realize this day those things that often stand between us, that often interfere with our relationship with you and our relationship with others. We bring them to you, O oh Lord, and lay them at your feet. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your love. We ask that your grace would work in and through us, that your mercy would be alive in and through us as well. And in this season, May we not only receive forgiveness, but may we give forgiveness to those others as well. We ask your blessings, and we ask your presence with us as we go forth. In Christ's name, and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Anyway, I hope you'll take time to hug somebody, give them a high five, and let them know how glad you are to be here.